He's the former president and publisher of the Sun Herald, and now he's on the radio. Welcome to Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. We had a great conversation just then with Vincent Creel. If you didn't have an opportunity to listen to that conversation, you can go to Facebook and uh, and listen. He gives some very wise advice about just using common sense and practicing your your your, your, your you know pursuit of happiness at home until we get an all clear note. It's really important. We've been told over and over again that it's a dangerous situation and there are things we can do to protect your family. So please do that. I'm, I'm privileged today to have John McFarland in the second segment. Uh, he's the executive director for the Southeast Mississippi chapter of the Red Cross, someone I worked with at the Sun-Herald for my entire career. Uh, it's great to see you again, John, and welcome to the show. Good seeing you, too. Congratulations on your show, by the way. Thank, thank you, man. We've had to shift gears. We, you know, we're really focused on highlighting the leaders that are making Coastal Mississippi a great place to live, work, and play. But you know what? The situation is what it is. And just like we did at the Sun-Herald when we work together, we, you, you make adjustments to the right. situation that we face. It is odd, though. After all you and I went through with Katrina, and then, of course, we had the BP oil spill and then Bonnie Carey situation, that here we are once again facing a challenge in the community. What thoughts do you have about that, John? You know, the, a couple of things. One is that this is probably one of the most prepared communities in the country because of all of that. And not just the people, but the leadership. You know, all of our coast emergency managers, for example, have been in the slot for a long time. They've been through Katrina. They've been through the oil spill. They've been through many of them go back two or three more hurricanes. And they really know what they're doing. And they've got good crews. Our, our mayors and supervisors, most of them have been through it. So unlike a lot of places in the country, they're not dealing with a disaster for the first time. And, and that's... Mm-hmm. That should make people feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah, that comes up. It came, it came up in my conversation with Vincent. It has come up in other conversations as well that is literally built into our DNA yeah. to respond. That we have become, because of the toughness we developed through these difficult times, we've become extraordinarily resilient. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's, and that's, that's shown again with this. Yeah. yeah. So, John, listen, I want to I want people to be reminded about the mission of of the Red Cross, et cetera. But let's get the really important thing out of the way right from the very beginning. How does this virus impact you and to what extent can you help people have confidence in your mission as it relates specifically to the blood supply? Yeah. Well, like everybody else, we are taking a lot of precautions. Uh, We uh, um, have our people as much as possible. Uh, working remotely, we've done, we've dropped a lot of non-essential things, but uh, you know the Red Cross has three primary missions that uh, that cannot stop. Uh, we we you know the, our congressional charter requires us to be the lead in disaster relief, and uh, we're still doing that. We've had two tornadoes in Mississippi this week, and we've had people on the ground ever since working those. Uh, we do home fires every day somewhere around the chapter. There's a single or multifamily home fire. Those are being responded to just as always. We just have to do it a little bit differently. And then you mentioned the blood. You know, the blood, uh, the nation's blood supply was is always low in January coming off the holidays. Um, and, and, and winter storms and things like that, that, that cause a lot of... Uh, cancellations in January. So normally the, the blood supply is tight coming into the first of the year. Then you add the virus on top of it. And, and between uh, January, the middle of January and the middle of the March, uh, over 200,000 units of blood were not collected that otherwise would have been because blood drives uh, were canceled. And as you know, uh, with a unit of blood, you really can help three people. you got red blood cells, plasma, and platelets. So you're looking at a potential 600,000 Americans that uh, would not have had access to the blood supply they need. So we've done some things uh, uh, differently. Um, For one thing, we're not doing during the COVID scare uh, or COVID crisis, large blood drive for obvious reasons. You know, for us, it's great when you go someplace and you got 300 people there and you're going to come away drawing a couple hundred units of blood. That's normally what it's all about. Now we're doing very small ones. 
uh, where you've got, you know, 25, 30 people during a five hour period that are coming in. Uh, we've added a number of safety precautions. If you go to a blood drive now, you don't get into the building until you have your temperature taken. Because that's, you know, if your temperature is okay, you're okay. Um, so the, the, the temperature is checked first. Uh, our people are masked and gloved. We do maintain social distancing, so you're never going to be closer than six feet to anybody other than that person drawing your blood, who, like I said, is masked and gloved. All the surfaces that are touched are constantly sanitized. So uh, if you've done a blood drive lately, you know one of the things you're going to be is on a laptop or on a, on a uh, tablet doing your, your, your uh, health check. It's wiped down before you touch it and it's wiped down after you touch it. Uh, the, the chairs that you donate in are wiped down, sanitized before you get in it and as soon as you get out of it. So we've taken a number of precautions that, uh, that protect our, our staff and volunteers, but also the uh, donors. And that's, that's critically important. Uh, and we've been fairly lucky because we've made up a, a lot of the loss over the last few weeks by having a lot more of these small blood drives. It's a little bit inconvenient sometimes to donors. We've been having blood drives here at our golf court office about three times a week. We don't normally do that. We normally do maybe one a quarter because it's just not a real big facility. But for this, it's perfect. It's a little bit inconvenient because when people come in, if they're more than 15 minutes ahead of their appointment, they're going to have to wait in their car. Then they'll be called to the front door. Well, they'll have, they'll have their temperature check before they even come into the building. And then we've got three other rooms set aside, so we never have more than two people in a room at a time uh, to keep the spacing before you go in and give blood. And in, in our training room, where we normally do blood tribes and we can have five donors going at one time, we now only have two. So it's, it's different, but it's working. So, John, what you're doing uh, is by appointment, actually. So people can sign up online. Are you actually reaching out to people specifically and asking them to come in? Yes. yes. You know, Red Cross has a donor database, people who are regular donors. And they're, they're, if you're one of them, you're always getting called or emailed and asked to come to a drive. We're reaching out to people that we know. Uh, and then every time we have an opportunity, including this one, I want to remind people to just go to redcrossblood.org redcrossblood.org and put your zip code in and it'll show you drives in your, you know, near you and you make your appointment right on there. Now, some people do walk up and uh, um, we, we work them in, uh, but obviously the appointments come first. Uh, but so it's, you know, it's like I said, we're, we're doing our job. We're doing it differently. Even with the disaster relief, we're doing our job. We're just doing it a little bit differently to protect ourselves and to uh, protect our clients. And the last thing is, the, another advantage besides the community being a very generally very well prepared is that Red Cross has become a really high tech organization over the past five to 10 years. And so, you know, even before coronavirus, we have people here sitting at a desk in this chapter supporting Red Cross uh, operations in California for the wildfires, Tennessee for their tornado and along the East Coast uh, last year for Hurricane Dorian. We've even had people here assisting in the, uh, the uh, after the earthquake in Nepal, the, the uh, earthquake in Haiti. So technology allows us to do things <clears throat> that, that uh, minimizes the contact we have to have with people. We don't yeah. like because, you know, you, 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 one of the things we offer people in disaster is hope. Sitting down talking to somebody who's telling them it's going to be all right and here's what we're going to do is important. But we're we're minimizing that <clears throat> now. But but the, the job continues to go on. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting, and we can continue this. We got a couple more minutes in this segment. But the amount of the disasters, um, particularly related to hurricanes, you think about just look back the last couple of years, has been phenomenal. What the Red Cross, the burdens that they've had on them. Um, have you actually been deployed to any of those uh, locations? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, we just here in Mississippi, well, first of all, let me back up and tell you that one thing that's not good is that Mississippi ranks number one in the nation in uh, disaster threats. Uh, we have more house fires per capita. We have more tropical storms and other uh, tornadoes. Last year, 110 tornadoes in Mississippi. Uh, wow. 
almost every county in the state had a tornado. There were 48 counties that had long-term flooding. So uh, in our business, we, we talk about blue skies and gray skies. Gray skies are when we are actually actively deployed in a disaster relief. Blue skies is when it's business as usual. And typically in years past, the Red Cross chapter would spend maybe 12 to 18 weeks of the year in gray skies. Last mm -hmm. week, we spent 12 weeks in blue skies. Wow. It's been, yeah. That's incredible. Hey, so John, why don't we do this? We're, we're coming down with less than a minute to go. Um, when we come back, I want to I want to start, I want to remind people how the, the overall mission of the Red Cross and about the very specific federal instrument that was created to make the Red Cross viable. You, viable. you, you alluded to it a second ago, but I think it would be helpful to remind people about the overall mission of the Red Cross and how integrated it is in uh, everything that we may need at some point in our lives. So we'll be back after this break. This is John McFarland from the uh, local Red Cross. We'll see you in just a second. Follow Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1 on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Super Talk MS Coast 103.1. Here in Mississippi, we're known for our hospitality. Getting together with friends and showing affection is a big part of who we are. And now, it's time to stop. At least for a little while. You can help slow the coronavirus by staying home as much as possible. Avoid social gatherings and avoid all unnecessary travel. The simple act of just staying put could go a long way. The coronavirus is here. So Mississippi, let's get serious about stopping it. Talking to the people that help make the coast such a unique place to live. This is Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. We have John McFarlane from the Red Cross with us today. And in the in the first segment with John, we talked a lot about the blood shortage and the way that the, the Red Cross is making adjustments and the way they do business. Um, you can go into the Red Cross website and make appointments. They're going way out of their way to make sure that the process of giving blood is safe. And the other thing that they're doing is they're, they're while they are not having the big drives they would typically have at, at companies, they're, they're having people come to their offices in Gulfport about three days a week. And, they're, and they're, they're doing a really good job of filling in the gaps that they're missing from doing the corporate drives. So a lot of effort, a lot of use of technology. You can go onto the website to, to, uh, to sign up, or you may get contacted for them. But, but just know that a lot of work's been done to make sure it's a safe process. John, in this segment, I want to uh, come back and just kind of remind people about the Red Cross mission and the very unique legal status that, is, that has created the American Red Cross and what that congressional charter requires. So let's start from kind of the top. Yeah, you know, uh, the Red Cross, the International Red Cross was actually created as part of the Geneva Conventions back in 1865 uh, when, the, when the more than a dozen European leaders got together and wanted to develop some protocols governing the the rights of non-combatants during times of war, the wounded prisoners of war and civilians. And so they agreed to a set of protocols that we now call the Geneva Conventions. And one of the things they agreed to was that there had to be some kind of independent humanitarian organization that would monitor and be sure that these uh, conventions were being followed, but also would provide humanitarian aid to, at that time, victims of, of the strife of war. And that was quickly expanded to include natural disasters as well. So they created the International Red Cross. The, the name came because the guy who organized the Geneva Conventions shared it. It was a Swiss businessman. And in his honor, they took the Swiss flag, which is a white cross on a red, uh, uh, yeah, white cross on a red field, and reversed it. Every nation that signs the Geneva Convention has to have a Red Cross society. It, when the United States signed the Geneva Convention in 1900, they issued a charter to the American Red Cross, which already existed, but it was, it was a, a small independent organization. And that charter requires us to provide disaster relief in all every county and parish in the United States and its possession. It also requires the Red Cross to provide certain services to the armed forces and their families. Those were the two original 
uh, missions of the Red Cross. That charter has been expanded and updated several times, including the latest was in 2007, after President uh, Bush uh, uh, created the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11. One, the Red Cross has always worked well with FEMA because they, they have the official government responsibility for disaster planning and relief. But to make that coordination even better, uh, in times of a presidential declared emergency, the Red Cross falls under the Department of Homeland Security as kind of an equal partner with FEMA. So we spend a lot, a lot of our time in blue skies is spent working with our county emergency managers, Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Uh, we, we're very lucky there because Greg Michelle, somebody we worked with when he was commander at the uh, at, at Camp Shelby, our services to armed forces teams work closely with him, and he's uh, he's been an excellent uh, uh, um, uh, leader of, of, of MEMA. We work closely together with them. So yeah, we 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 have the unique legal status of a federal instrumentality which means we are a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization, just like any United Way agency. But we also have that uh, congressional charter. And what that means is we can't stop. Uh, we, we have to provide the services of the armed forces and the disaster relief. Every county parish in the United States and in our possessions in the Caribbean and the Pacific. And so we're, you know, while others can say we don't have enough money to do this or we don't have staff there or you know the virus we're shutting things down we can't do it we just yeah. have to find another way to get it done and that's uh, you know that's that's a big responsibility but it's also very rewarding to be part of it so john just uh we got a couple minutes left and uh, i think all that thank you for providing that kind of background it helps explain why there were so few blue sky days last year that you said there were gray skies and blue skies, gray skies when they're doing some kind of deployment somewhere. The Red Cross has been really busy and you can understand why they have so many different dimensions they have to work on simultaneously and the COVID-19 situation has only made more of that. So John, make your last plea in the last minute that we have to businesses that you still want them to, to help you guys. Tell us how. Yeah, for businesses that can, or businesses or churches, anybody that can host a blood drive, uh, to give us a to give us a call uh, um, or, or email us. Uh, my email, if I can give it, is John yes. McFarland two at redcross.org. John McFarland two at redcross.org, and we'll we'll work with you to schedule it. The other thing is, this is a volunteer based organization. You know, we we have we don't have a lot of paid staff around the country, but we've got 307,000 trained volunteers, and we always need more. Uh, and so the, the other thing you can do is go to the Red Cross website, and up at the top you'll see volunteer. Just go on that if you're interested in becoming a volunteer. Put in a couple of contact information, and we'll contact you. So that's that's terrific. John, we're, we're out of time, but we'll have you back in a couple of weeks and get an update on how things are going. But thanks for your leadership on this and good luck to you guys through this process. All right. Good, good working with you again. Okay, buddy. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks.